you know, serve your lunch quietly and just uh, pay attention to the event coming now. I uh, would like, before the event starts, huh? yes, yes, <laughs> before I introduce the panel, I would like to pay your attention to something. Where is Laurent? Laurent? Oh, he's not here. Yeah, he's supposed, we're supposed to know who is going to leave today. Anybody is leaving today? You, two, uh, three. Who else is leaving today? Because we have a survey sheet here, and it's very important for all of you to fill this survey. We need your help in giving us, you know, your opinion in the conference, since this conference is the first one to help us for next year's conference, where we'd really like to meet you again in Ottawa. Anyway, I would like to get that uh, survey. We don't have enough copies. I think he went to, uh, Laurent went to get more copies. But we'll make priority to the people who are leaving today to make sure the survey is done and give it to Laurent or to the registration desk. And the rest of you, all of you, going to get a copy of this survey before to leave this room. And um, the panel session at the moment is a quite exciting one as well when you're having your lunch. Uh, the panel uh, uh, title, it Challenges and the Prospective Solutions for Ensuring the Personal Information, Privacy, Accessible, and Secure Technology. It's a very interesting topic. I have the uh, panelists here, uh, I would say them from right to left, Marseille, Stephanie, uh, Matt, Louis, uh, Louis, <laughs> and me. And the moderator is Gary Kenwood. I would say um, full introduction is not in front of me here, <laughs> Gary. Their bio, you know, but I would say uh, uh, later the moderator of the panel, maybe we can put more emphasis on the bio for each panel, and we will have a bit more. I'm going to introduce them. Okay, or introduce them when you start it, since I don't have them in my hand. I would leave the mic to Kenmore, to Gary, uh, to start now, and you will eat later, Gary. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit off script at this point uh, in my introduction. Uh, when we proposed this idea way back months ago, uh, actually was uh, a panel member who brought up the issue of security on the internet and we thought, well, there's an opportunity for a general discussion about privacy, personal information privacy. And uh, Glenn McKnight has been my collaborator on setting up this panel. I observed today that there have actually been a number of papers and discussions around privacy during this conference, uh, somewhat maybe disproportionate to the wide range of topics. So this is a very important this, uh, topic area. It's very important and topical right now for Canada because of a number of activities going on. C13, the new privacy commissioner. Um, and I think it's very fortunate that we have such a great panel here and an opportunity to talk about it. We have a very diverse panel here today. Uh, a very brief introduction. I, I invite you all to read the more detailed uh, biographies that's, a, that's available in the, in the program. Um, first of all, we have Louis Houle, who is with ISOC Quebec. Uh, he's the president of ISOC Quebec, uh, the Internet Society. It's the low, oldest chapter within Canada. And Internet Society is basically responsible for the promotion and governance, governance of the Internet globally. Um, 
Louis is also uh, served with serves with Connect Quebec, an organization that focuses on high-speed internet development in Quebec, which is also a humanitarian issue. And uh, he's responsible for training and knowledge transfer provided in, in regions where people are not that familiar with internet operation. Uh, next to Louis, we have Neil Schwartzman. Uh, Neil was uh, one of the earliest in Canada uh, to take up uh, the fight against spam in Canada, and he wrote the first distributed spam filtering software. Uh, he's the executive director of the Internet's oldest uh, end use advocacy group, the Coalition Against Unsolicited Commercial Email. And we all hate spam. Always disagreeing with me. Thank you. Uh, so it's been very, very good work. Um, and he was awarded for his efforts in this area uh, in the first. Uh, sorry, let me get this right. First annual M3AAWG. You can maybe explain what that is. Uh, Mary Lutinsky Award for lifetime achievement in his work in anti-internet uh, abuse. He's also participated in many U.S. and, uh, sorry, working groups on internet abuse. Uh, next to, sorry, I forget the notes here. Next to uh, Neil is Matt Broda. Matt Broda is with Bell currently, um, where he's a technical fellow for Security Canada. He also has a startup called 140, which is developing um, privacy enhancing technologies uh, to protect individual privacy. Uh, he's very much involved, and long history involved, in security and privacy issues with major corporations and with the community. Next to Matt, we have Stephanie Aram. Stephanie, very interesting, uh, was with the group, actually the director of the group that helped develop Canada, one of Canada's privacy legislation, the so-called Pip of the Hat, privacy, personal information privacy, and... Personal, information, personal information protection and electronic documents act. Thank you, I knew I would remember that. It, it makes for a great acronym, though. Right. People usually refer to it as Tripita. Uh, she's very active, continuously. She, she was with the federal government at the time, actually, had a 30-year career with the federal government. She loves the federal government. She has a private uh, consulting effort uh, going. Um, and she's uh, currently active, very much active in the internet community. She's on the ICANN working group, uh, looking at privacy issues within ICANN. ICANN is an association that basically monitors all the internet addresses, for those of you who are not involved in internet technology, internet addresses, name names, uh, and the some of the infrastructure, the top level infrastructure that manages that. And she's currently on the Who Is Working Group, for those of you who are really into internet technology. Um, and last, yeah. Neil Schwartzman is uh, with us from no, I'm Neil, sorry. Marcel. Marcel. <laughs> I like getting introduced twice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Marcel is uh, from IBM, uh, but he's here representing basically, if I may, the enterprise aspects of security and privacy. Uh, he's for 30 years been working in a professional capacity doing security audits, uh, security <coughs> design, security assessments, uh, both uh, formal audits based on existing standards, ISO and COVID, and he has much experience working with enterprises trying to develop better protection against uh, uh, security interlopers and privacy invasions. I hope I get everybody fairly uh, I'm going to go quickly. I haven't opened the statement, but I want to, we've lost a little bit of time, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, and this is kind of my personal view, and it sets the stage. A lot of people in Canada, particularly North America and the world, do not feel that they are vulnerable in terms of their privacy information. Uh, the average person does not feel that they've done anything or that there's any information about themselves that, that they worry about other people's lives. And this is very, a very dangerous attitude. 
Um, we all have things that we like to keep private that we like other people not to know about. We have medical records. We have our own, uh, call them guilty pleasures, that we'd rather not show up, not be visible to our potential employers, right? Uh, they may be perfectly legitimate, legal activities, but we just rather not have to explain it in an interview or to a, a performance review. Um, and we have associations and friendships and political views that we'd rather not appear on some list, government list or political party list that says, well, that person holds an opposing yeah. view. These are all pieces of information that could make life certainly more difficult uh, for us, if not impossible. Um, and it's actually very easy on the internet to extract this information from your daily activities. Uh, a lot of people are under the impression that privacy information is related to your name, your phone number, your address, a lot of stuff that is actually easy to access without the internet. But in fact, using simple techniques to, moder to, to mo uh, monitor your tele cell phone usage, your internet access, people can actually track you as you do your day-to-day -day activities. Align that with a few of the other databases that exist on the internet. They can determine who you saw, who you visited, whether you went and saw an oncologist, which might imply you have a risk of cancer, whether you visited a political office, or whether you went shopping for comic books. And this is information that you might not want everybody to know. This kind of activity is going on today, not just as a, an informal, malicious activity on the part of uh, hackers or whatever you want to call them. Recently, we've seen the disclosures, both north and south of the border, where there's been government activity in this area. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of action on the part of the government to protect our privacy. Um, so it is an important issue, and it's important that we raise the awareness from a humanitarian perspective. There's also a global aspect today, um, which I'll leave to the panelists whether they want to address it. We all know of incidents around the world where, where journalists and so forth have been persecuted for their expression of opinion on oh, the internet. Some of my... uh, we also know the plus side, the Arab Spring and so forth, which happened in part because of the influence of the internet. So there's a double edge to this technology. And it's a humanitarian issue. We need to protect people. And we need proper ways to protect people that uh, are easy and easily available. Um, the way we're going to run this uh, this session is really a Q&A format. We're going to try something a little bit different. And it's only just simply to kind of steer the panelists a bit, and as well as to keep everybody in the, in the audience kind of in track of what we, we're talking about. Um, so the first question that we have is a general one. What is information privacy? What does, does the in, average individual really need to be concerned? Who wants to go first? Um, I, I'm the lucky winner, I guess. Um, two inches ago, the main microphone, I'll try to remember that. Um, so by the way, first of all, let me start by saying that uh, I'm actually speaking on behalf of Bell uh, during this session. Um, I'm kind of speaking from my original experience and you know, the startup that's, that me and my partner have been running around the privacy technology. Um, and you know, the short story there is we've done quite a bit of research looking at people's need of privacy, especially in the online environment. And you know, we looked at building a business case for actually building some privacy enhancing technologies. The good news is that the technology is there. The technology has been there for a while. Quite often it's a little bit cumbersome to use. But most often, you know, what we found is that people value their privacy. But they value it only a tiny little bit. Um, and especially when it comes to monetary side of things. There are some interesting studies done, um, especially in Europe, where privacy is very much in the forefront of the public policy and the European Network and Information Security Agency, NISA, has run some very interesting studies to basically peg the, the value of user privacy when it comes to some uh, you know, pieces of information, which is you know, very common, email addresses, telephone numbers, and things like that. 
That doesn't necessarily mean you know, privacy in total, it means specific information. But people pay the value of this information at around about half a euro. So they are going to give it to you if the value that they are getting back is about half a euro. Or in other words, they are going to pay half a euro for a service that does not require them providing this information in order to get the value. So I think, you know, the, the question of privacy is not necessarily about the question, do people buy privacy, is privacy is, is important? It is important. But I think the question is, what privacy should, what the privacy should, should be applied to, to what extent, and what value are we getting for forfeiting our right to privacy? Thanks. Uh, I would like to be the end user, seeing privacy and trying to describe it and see what uh, I have in front of me. Uh, usually when we think of privacy, we think that government are, are going to take care of it anyway. So there is a lot of privacy yeah, for Canada. And it is very complete. As an end user, when you see that it covers identifying numbers, symbols, uh, it covers uh, uh, blood type, uh, prints, and so many things. I feel kind of confident that they've been, they're, they're covering most of the issue about privacy. For the Quebec Act, it's covering all information related to an individual. And all types of information that would allow you to identify an individual. So, you like to think that you're going to be protected. Fine. <coughs> These laws are not covering all types of individuals, nor groups within the society. It can be for commercial uh, 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 privacy. It can be for uh, the privacy within governments, for civil servants, that they have to apply in their day-to-day -day work. So uh, I'm kind of puzzled if those laws are really, really covering uh, my needs as an end user. And since I'm from the Internet Society, I would like to share with you what we think is privacy. It's a consensual sharing of information, personal data, with a specific context, with an expectation of scope. It might be a little bit different from what we do with the government, but I think that uh, I, I would like to discuss that <laughs> Thanks very much. Having worked for about 10 years, first on the national privacy standard that Canada produced through the Canadian Standards Association, and then putting that standard into PIPADA as law, you would think I would be very enthusiastic about legal protection of privacy, and I believe it's necessary, but I don't believe it is by any means the most effective way to manage privacy. So when I was on the stump trying to promote this back in the 90s, we used to say at Industry Canada that it was a toolkit, a privacy toolkit. Um, you needed law, you needed management practices or standards, hence the first move we made was to get the private, National Privacy Center. You need public education, arguably the hardest part, and you need privacy enhancing technologies. And there were plenty. I used to have a little symposium on privacy enhancing technologies way back, I think 93 was the first year we did it. And the problem is nobody goes for them if they don't know they need them. And that brings me to my definition of what privacy, I think, really is at its heart. And the Germans talk about this in the, in the context of their constitution. It is the right to control your own personal information. And the problem in an information society is that control becomes increasingly difficult uh, to manage. Uh, and if you do not understand risk, information risk, then you don't know what you shouldn't be consenting to. Pardon the negatives in that sentence. I hope that was clear enough. So what we have is legal frameworks that are based on informed consent, 
and people don't understand what they should be informed about. So actually, when I finished getting the law into Parliament, actually, I think my minister, Bonnie, was doing that. So when I stopped working for the law, and it was well on its way, uh, I went and worked for Zero Knowledge Systems here in Montreal because they were working on privacy enhancing technologies and having also worked on cryptography policy, I had a pretty good idea of why you might want to encrypt your traffic on the internet, your web browsing. But while I was at Zero Knowledge, we could not sell the product. There were, I remember being sent out to a, a trade show in Las Vegas. It was a medical uh, show. There were 1,800 websites, busy marketing medical services in the United States mostly. Dr. Coop was the big thing back then. None of those sites had encryption. People were having all of their data sniffed off the site. We could explain it to the organizations running the site, but they said, well, nobody is asking us for this, and we can't justify spending the money on it, even if it was peanuts. So none of those sites were encrypted, and that data has been vacuumed up for the past 15 years. So exercising control depends on that toolkit, and that's really what we're talking about. And in terms of a privacy maturity model in the information society, we are at the bottom line. And so I think that said no. Exactly. Neil and I are going to agree on this one, I think. Sadly, yes. <laughs> Well, first off, I want to say what a, a great honor it is to be here. I'm not an engineer, but my father was iron ring and all. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm truly uh, honored to be here. As, as a result, I'm sure he would have been very proud or very skeptical of what I'm about to say. Um, I think Joni Mitchell said it, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. And what we're hearing here, you know, you're right. People will trade their privacy, their most private, intimate details, not even for five euros. I mean, go on to any teenager's Facebook or Instagram account and you can